Um, before I launch into it, anyone who is familiar with Fundraiser Girl, um, the, the most interesting part of it is uh, someone once came up to me at a conference and said, your, your Tumblr is so funny, you're so hilarious. And my husband was really floored because he thinks I'm like the least funny person ever. So if you're expecting me to do like really good jokes, I, I apologize already. Um, so I want to talk to you about this website I started called Fundraiser Girl. It's a, it's a Tumblr blog. And I'll get into what it is, but um, kind of about my journey of starting it and trying to create a community of people who are professional fundraisers, um, trying to give them a place where they can go and they can laugh and they can uh, relate to each other and share knowledge with each other, but in a really tongue-in-cheek kind of way. My motto is that nonprofits shouldn't be non-fun. And if you want to tweet, feel free. I won't assume that you're texting on your phone. That's my Twitter handle right there. <laughs> so, um, I'd love to know who y'all are before I get into who I am. Um, and the first thing I want to do uh, is a little activity. It's an SFU community building activity. I apologize in advance. And so, this is how it works. And this right here is this room. So, uh, so, I want you to imagine that where I'm standing is right in this room. It takes a lot of imagination. And the, the other end is as far away from this room as you can get. And I want you guys to line up based on where you were born. So say St. Paul's might be here, VGH might be here, Seattle might be here, you know, China might be down there. So you can talk. All right. I did this recently. Alberta, Alberta, we're somewhere close but not that close. I did this recently in San Antonio. I had to explain to a room full of Americans that um, Alaska is not actually farther away than Nova Scotia. <laughs> so yeah, this would be west, we're going to yeah. south, yeah. or yeah. south, or yeah. south, or south, or Oh, okay. Yeah, the... <laughs> yeah we're going to yeah. Is anyone from Okay, you're right. You're safe. 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 You're You're safe. 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 you you guys don't know. Lion's Gate, Lion's Gate. Go call your parents, have some conversation. It's a beautiful story. Uh, Royal Columbia. Royal Columbia. Maryville. Victoria. Kelowna. Calgary. Calgary. Fort McMurray. All right. I think we've got some West Coast Americans down here. San Francisco. Down the line. Toronto. Toronto. Woo! That's where I was born. Any, any women's college hospital? Sure. Yeah, I should have known there were in St. Paul's Hill. All right, further down, Birmingham, London. Okay, okay, UK, London, Taiwan, Switzerland. Nick is Nick from London. London, Taiwan, Far East. Where's the Far East? All right, of the three people at the back, who do you think was born the farthest away? Of the three in the back, who's, who was born the farthest away? Or the three of you? It's going to be hard to give this book to all three of you. Uh, I'm thinking of a number between one and three. Thinking of a number, it's either one, two, or three. Green shirt. All right, you got it. <laughs> all right, sit down. Feel free to sit down with different people than you were sitting with. We all know each other now. We know where we were born. I heard a little bit about what's your story. Um, so I work in a kind of fundraising. I've always worked in fundraising. I've never worked in anything that's not fundraising except for one job where I sold clothing, and the clothing was so bad I might as well have been fundraising. Because um, they're basically giving me money for nothing. So I work in a kind of fundraising called Major Gifts, which basically means big money from rich people and sometimes big money from companies. Or sometimes it means little money from people who could give, give us big money in the future. So 
I'm not, you know, actually tweeting people and asking for $5 donations. I'm sitting down, looking a millionaire in the eyes and saying, I'd like you to consider an investment of $5 million in this project. So I do a lot of talking and working with people on sales skills, on how to talk to someone who's super duper rich and still feel good about yourself, on how to ask someone for $5 million when you have nothing to give them back. I don't actually work a lot with digital. I don't ever tweet in a work capacity. I, uh, I don't, I'm not an expert in this. I just have my personal experience and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, so I really have no idea what I'm doing. Um, that said, I've, I've noticed some things that have worked, I've noticed some things that haven't worked and I've done some things wrong and I'm happy to talk to you about what that's been. I have a budget of zero dollars. I spent zero dollars on fundraiser for all this. Well, it's kind of a lie. I bought some buttons once for a conference, but um, I spend no money on this website. And I have a full-time job that has nothing to do with social media, has nothing to do with Tumblr. So this is done in my spare time. I do this on the bus on my way to work. I do this sitting in bed with my laptop. I'm seriously, seriously, seriously not a tech person. I love this. I, I, sometimes I feel like just I'm, I'm just a puppy. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I do spend a lot of time on the internet. And I'm a healthy amount of time in the deep, dark crevices of the internet where bizarre, funny, wonderful, awesome things live. And a lot of time on Tumblr. So um, how many people in this room are kind of familiar with Tumblr in general? Hands up. How many people think they know how to pronounce this word? <laughs> okay, so um, what I'm going to be talking today is a lot about is our memes, which are kind of these funny, weird things that for some reason get really popular on the internet. And one of my favorite examples is this is a monkey who was left at Ikea wearing nothing but a Sherman coat. He was a very dapper monkey out for a day of buying a crude dresser and a mom bed, and uh, he got stranded in Ikea, and he looks so sad and he's wearing a Sherman coat, and it exploded on the internet. Um, people combined it with other memes. This is the successful business cat who's realizing he forgot to pick up Carl. People created uh, instructions on how to make your very own monkey. Um, this, is a, this is a fundraising mem from a guy called Jeff Brooks, who um, is a fundraiser who really hates social media in general, um, and does not like Giving Tuesday does not like uh, methodology, and, or not, doesn't like methodology, and also really hates rebranding. He hates rebranding. Um, so it's kind of things that are popular and get repurposed and retold, and, and the internet kind of takes control of it. There was a great photo of Beyonce making this really horrible face, and she wanted it taken out from the internet, and the internet responded by like taking this image and doing 100 million things with it. Um, I love that. I love that we come together and do these kooky things with people we don't even know. So a GIF uh, is like, like, it's like a little moving picture. Uh, they're really popular on Tumblr. Uh, they kind of started in the 90s and they're like the dancing bananas and they've kind of gone from there. Um, someone tweeted me saying they really wanted to learn in this session how to make these. And my dirty secret is that I don't, that almost any GIF you need is out there on the internet already, and you literally just search like cat taking glasses off GIF image search, and it's there. Um, I once needed for Nick's wife a photo of a deer wearing high heeled shoes falling down, and it was on the internet because the internet is a beautiful, <laughs> weird, wonderful place where you can find anything. At, at some point, some of you are probably judging me a little bit, saying, like, Isn't it pronounced GIF? And I think it is, but I like GIF with a G instead of a J, because it's like a, sorry, with a G, because it's like a gift. It's like a beautiful gift to the world. So that's, that's how I say it. I apologize if you don't like my pronunciation. So Fundraiser Girl, I'm trying to remember if I linked to it. I don't think I did. It's, it's a website that basically has these weird captions. I don't know how to use a Mac. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, of just these situations that we experience as fundraisers and, and kind of my emotional reaction to them. 
And I started it because there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of fundraisers in Canada, people whose job it is to raise money for nonprofits, and we are not represented at all in pop culture. You know, there's no TV show about fundraisers. They're not, you know, the best friend in the movie isn't a fundraiser. You know, there's a lot of architects and lawyers and cops and doctors, but there's not a lot of fundraisers. But the truth is, there's a lot of fundraisers in life. Um, and that's why I started it, was I just wanted to give us something that was fun and uh, purely entertainment that had to do with our very unique and very crazy profession. And Girl is spelled like that with two R's. Uh, it's kind of a throwback to my favorite music genre, Riot Girl, which uh, in the 90s came out of the punk movement to create a very feminist, very um, kind of uh, proactive, not proactive, what's the word I'm looking for? You, you just said it. Not proactive. Anyways, uh, a very kind of left-wing space for women in the punk rock movement, and they spelled G-R-R-R-L, um, so it's just a little hat tip to that, which no one ever gets. And so I created Fundraiser Girl, and the first person I sent it to was actually Siobhan, because she has, yeah, she has the perfect combination of a lot of knowledge about fundraising and a really great sense of humor, and it has exploded from there. So I, I started it a year and a half ago, and today I get about a thousand visitors a day during the week. None on the weekends. It's people sitting in their office, not doing work, looking at my website. <laughs> and then on the weekends, they're out living their lives. Um, I've had over 200,000 visitors since I began. When I started it a year and a half ago, I had less than 300 Twitter followers, and I think today I'm up to 5,760. Um, in a year and a half, which, um, again, for someone who doesn't do this and doesn't, this isn't my job, it's been kind of crazy. So the scenarios are kind of like things that everyone who has professionally raised money has experienced. So when a big gift is undesignated, you, got, you have no idea how great that is. That is like pure, when someone says, I'm going to give you money, you can pay salaries with it. You can pay, you can keep your lights on with this money. You can pay your rent with this money. That is crazy. Because normally they want to give it, you know, I want this money to go to cat food, or I want it to go to a, you know, a bursary for an Aboriginal student, which is awesome. But every once in a while I get that undesignated gift, and it's great. Um, <laughs> when your coworker doesn't put things in Razor's Edge. <laughs> One of my favorite posts I've ever done um, is when you get caught not putting things in Razor's Edge, and it's the crab from um, Finding Nemo, and he's like, I am ashamed. Because I rag on people constantly on my blog for not putting things in our CRM database and for keeping information in their heads, which is so stupid when fundraisers leave their jobs every two years. Um, but yet I do it too. I get called out all the time for that. Charity knows because it was her job to make me put things in Razor's Edge. So when you're researching mobile donation platforms, <laughs> Uh, when you're filling out a huge grant application. Has anyone in this room ever filled out the BC Lottery Corporation grant application? Oh dear God, I have never run a marathon, but it is worse than running a marathon. I say that having never run a marathon. When a colleague gives you a list by printing off the Excel spreadsheet and handing it to you to edit instead of emailing it to you. This is a real story that really happened to someone trying to pull a difficult query from Razor's Edge. I don't know if you can read that. It says, computer says no. <laughs> Which Razor's Edge, basically, like, your, your whole thing just freezes and shuts down. So I'm really here to tell you, because not all of you will find fundraiser go funny, because not all of you are professional fundraisers, but what I learned in the process of starting this website. The first one is define your audience. Understand who your people are. Uh, and Siobhan's a great example of that. My people are professional fundraisers. I'm not making this website for people who work in the nonprofit world who aren't some way involved in asking people for money. They are people who are comfortable with the internet. They are people who have a good sense of humor. Um, my audience is people from Vancouver, Toronto, the west coast of the States, London and Australia predominantly. They are mainly people who work in annual giving and prospect research, which is odd because I don't work in either of those. Um, I should say, I, I work in major gifts. My husband does plan giving. My father runs a consultancy company. 
My mother does event fundraising, and two of my best friends are fundraisers. So fundraising is my entire life. It is what I talk about when I go home. It is, so that is kind of part of the reason I started it. And know your audience. So understand, when are they online? When are they tweeting? When are they reading my tweets? When are they going to my website? Thursday and Friday are my most popular days, so I'd like to make sure my funniest, most shareable stuff gets posted on Thursday and Friday. And I will save really good stuff for Thursdays and Fridays, knowing that those are my busiest days. I am a firm believer that there is no general public. If you're trying to reach everyone, you are going to fail. If you are sending great left-wing pro-life emails, Know that target, you know, or sorry, right wing pro right wing emails or left wing pro choice emails. Uh, but but know who they are, know what they want from you. Uh, even as simple as, and I'll talk about this later. Fundraiser girl fans like cats more than fundraiser girl fans like dogs. Cat stuff resonates more with my audience than dog stuff, raccoon stuff, bunny stuff. Like the the more targeted you know your audience, the the better your content is going to be. Create mental nods. This is um, a tip I'm, I'm swiping from direct mail. So when you get a letter in the mail asking you for money, you know, you're kind, you, you, based on what you know about your audience, you write things that you know they're going to agree with. So if you're sending a, a direct mail piece to a bunch of people who you know, support a nature conservancy charity, you're going to say things like, I was walking through nature today and I looked at the beautiful trees and they're nodding along and thinking, this like nature too, and they know what trees look like. And you, you know, you might say something like, I want this to be here for my grandchildren, and they're nodding along because they're probably over 60 and have grandchildren as well, and they want nature that you know you create these mental nods. And that's what I try and do with Fundraiser Girl. I try and create content that people are gonna nod along with. People really like to have what they believe kind of put in front of them for them to agree with. Someone once told me that beliefs are the crazy glue of humanity. And if you kind of say, this is who I am and this is what I believe in, and someone can see that echoed, their own beliefs echoed in you, that brings you really close together. So you have to talk about that, you have to put that out there, get people nodding along with you. So if you're a dog trainer, stuff about how great and lovable dogs are, people are going to nod along with that because they probably have and love dogs. This is a horrible gift. I couldn't find a better one. I'm, I'm a little ashamed. Um, you have to measure what you're doing. And like I said, I'm not, you know, I do this in my spare time, but I look at um, how many clicks does something get when I tweet it out? How many likes does it get on Tumblr? How many views does the page get? How many people are sharing it? You have to measure all of that stuff if you want to find what's working and replicate it. Uh, and, and the kind of off of that is test, test, and test some more. And this is, I love this, this is Mr. Burns deciding if he should buy ketchup or ketchup. <laughs> and if he was a fundraiser, I'd advise him to buy both, A, B, test it, and see what responded best with his audience. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I tried posting 10 times a day. I tried posting four times a day. I tried posting once a day. I tried not posting on the weekends. And for me, my sweet spot is about twice a day, is, is how many times my community wants me to post. Anymore, my readership drops, my click-throughs go down, um, it's too much, people aren't seeing it. Um, less than two um, people aren't coming as often because they're not expecting new content. And, you know, anytime, and I think this goes to anything to do with digital, because digital is so amazing. How lucky are we that we can actually see how many people are opening this email? How many people are clicking to go through this site? How many people are going to our online donation page? How many people get halfway through our donation page and quit? How many people make a donation? We can measure all of that. So much of what I do as a major gift fundraiser is not as measurable. I don't, when I'm sitting one-on-one -on -one with a donor, I don't get those instant results of how much they're resonating with it in such a measurable way. Um, we're doing an e-survey at SFU right now, and we've looked at best practices of what an e-survey should be, but what we're going to do is create our own best practices, and every time we send it out, we're going to A, B, test it, see what questions respond, what's the perfect length, what are the questions that get people responding to the survey, how long should the intro email be, um, 
every time we're going to A-B test it and come up with our own best practices. Repeat what works. Find what works and do lots and lots and lots of it. Um, I think a mistake that a lot of nonprofits make is they have a great story or they have a great case or they have a great something they want to share and they share it once and they assume everyone has seen it. Okay, we're done. Move on to the next thing. And it, you know, I think it takes on average about seven times putting something out to your community for a, for a good cross-section of people to see it. So if you're sending an email solicitation, you know, send it. Send it to the people who didn't open it. Send it again to the people who didn't open it. If you're sending a survey, keep resending it to the people who haven't responded. Um, if you have a story uh, that people are loving and commenting on and sharing, keep telling that story. Don't feel like you always have to be creating brand new, from scratch content. That's not something I can do. I mean, I, I hit hard on a lot of really familiar themes. Free food after board meetings is always popular. I talk about, has anyone ever like had that experience of like the board meeting's done, rush the staff room, they've got lasagna. It is the best, like it is the best thing ever. They get the good stuff. This board that kicks you around and is constantly not happy with your results and is constantly clawing back your budgets for direct mail and all of the things you need to raise money. Once in a while, they give you some leftover lasagna, and it is amazing. And I have, I have put this on Fundraiser Girl maybe a hundred times, and each time I put it back up, it gets, it gets retweeted, it gets clicked on, it gets shared. People love this. And cat gifts. People cannot get enough. I have used a cat reading military strategy maybe ten times. No one has even noticed. People love the, like, that is the perfect, that is my, I'm going into a board meeting and my revenues are down gift. Yeah. The cat reading military strategy. Um, little guy in the corner has been on fundraiser girl asking for a higher direct mail budget, um, begging a donor to get their final pledge payment in, um, asking for uh, PD funds to go to a conference. Um, I haven't found a use for redhead cat yet, so if anyone has any ideas. <laughs> Please tweet them my way. Um, uh, my community cannot get enough cat gifts. Uh, these are two of my more popular posts. Let's see if they'll come up. This one is entitled The Many Emotions of Rose's Edge. I feel like I need one of like waiting for waiting for a website to wait. So, you know, the confused puppy is trying to figure out a new query. Uh, come on. This guy is like a boss and he is closing off that proposal. Um, confused Urkel is um, reading about scandalous information about the major donors. And he's a little horrified about what he's learning about people he's raising money from. Uh, this is the coworker not putting things in Razor's Edge. This woman is upset because someone's come to you and said, ask you a question about a donor, and they didn't check Razor's Edge, and that information is in Razor's Edge, and we could have saved everyone's time if you just checked Razor's Edge before coming to me. Darth Vader is upset um, because someone who left your organization never put things in Razor's Edge. Um, head Desk is uh, doing data entry, um, and uh, Jason is, uh, you know, he's just happy that he has a great tool that helps him work with his donors better, which is at the end of the day, of all of the horrible emotions, um, a really great feature. Can I get a map person to come up and help me change me back? I brought my own PC, and we're not using it, I'm but that's okay. I refuse. Like, we weren't going to sell you this event last way. <laughs> Another one, I'm not going to walk through it. You can, you can find it on your own. I'll tweet it out. Is I have a, a Ryan Gosling as the perfect donor list. And he's someone who, like, he funds your ongoing operating costs. He gives it your end when you ask. You know, he never, he doesn't care if you put his name on anything. Um, really popular. And a lot of my audience are, are female. Um, give value to your audience. So it's really not about what your audience can do for you. It's about what can you give them. And Fundraiser Girl is all about giving smiles and laughs and a sense that you're not alone to the people who read it. So 
please don't think you can create a digital community because you deserve to have one, or because you want one, or it's the newest trendy thing. Um, if you're a cancer charity, the value to your audience is making the donors feel like they've made a positive difference in a cause they probably care a great deal about. It might also be giving them relevant information about how to live healthy lives. If you are the SPCA, maybe it's cute pictures of puppies. I actually love the SPCA's um, Twitter stuff. We, we tweet all the time. Uh, my grandmother has an adopted cat who's lovely. Um, and they like tell owners that they're good people for adopting pets. Like that's value you're giving to your audience. So always think about like what is in it for my readers? What can I give to them? How can I help them? How can I make their days better? Emotions matter. Um, I think one of the reasons Fundraiser Girl has been so popular and spread so quickly is because it is, at the end of the day, about emotions. Um, there's a strong emotional component to it, whether it is extreme frustration, angst, um, a really popular one that keeps coming up, a theme that keeps coming up from user submissions, is uh, when your revenues are down. And that feeling of, like, I have one from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and it's Giles talking about how the apocalypse is coming. And we, oh god, all of us fundraisers have felt that. Um, I remember being told at a job that we were targets where so and so was gone. Like, it, fundraising is really hard, uh, and it's emotionally exhausting, and it's, and you have to put those emotions into it. Um, and, I mean, looking at Vanessa, I'm thinking too that stories matter. Um, Vanessa is an expert on storytelling and the importance of storytelling. And I think what Fundraiser Girl does too is it lets people tell their own story. Um, I have heard the best and most awesome and the funniest and the most horrific stories. Some aren't safe for the web. Um, a lot are, are shared anonymously and kind of condensed. But people want to be able to tell their story and have someone hear it, even if it's just me. And I'll often get back in touch with the people who've shared stories and kind of say, I'm putting it on the site, it will be anonymous. But from me to you, I've been through that. It's horrible. I'm so sorry. Um, and that's, I mean, people love having the opportunity. And if we're nonprofits, we're doing something that people probably have a connection with and a story to tell. So using it, using your digital community as a venue for them to tell their story and share their own emotions is really important. Stop talking about yourself all the time. Um, I'm a big advocate for listening. I do not think as a society we value listening enough. I do not think we as human beings listen enough. And I think as fundraisers and nonprofits, we absolutely fail at listening in so many ways. One-on-one uh, -on -one when we're talking Donors, we fail listening with social media. Um, so if you have a, a, you know, a Twitter profile that just four times a day shares your vision statement and how awesome you are, that's not interesting to anyone. Um, so stop talking about yourself and find and join conversations. So I look for people who are on social media who are sharing their own stories, who are talking about fundraising, who are... Um, I have a few blogs, Vanessa's is one of them, and I like to search for who's tweeting about that fundraising blog, because it's a blog that I know and respect. Uh, people who are sharing that content probably will relate to my site, so I like to you know, say, you know, if someone's tweeted a great blog by Vanessa, I'll tweet them back and say, oh my gosh, she's amazing, did you know she's speaking in November? Find those conversations and, and insert yourself into them, instead of just broadcasting and expecting people um, to want to come to you. There's a great charity, uh, the Norwegian Cancer Society, and they use Twitter advanced search to find people tweeting about cancer in Norway, and they answer their questions about cancer, and they wish people well who have just been diagnosed with cancer, and they congratulate people for finishing the battle with cancer. If you're volunteering for the Norwegian Cancer Society, and you're tweeting and it's raining, they'll tweet you back saying, you know, I hope you brought an umbrella. They're, they're, they're finding people and they're getting into the conversation as opposed to waiting for people to come to them. And I think that is maybe the biggest tip I will give you today, is find where your community, where your audience is, find what they're talking about, and join that conversation. Be consistent. Um, don't be one of those you know, profiles who posts 100 times when you wake up in the morning and then never again for the rest of the day. It is very easy with Hootsuite and Tumblr to regulate your content. 
schedule it out in advance and be consistent. You see a resource someone can consistently expect good content from. Talk like a real person, not a boring corporate robot. Um, have a personality. Be a little bit sassy. Be a little bit sassy. You know, if you're um, be a human being because no one wants to interact with. You know, my strategic vision is a uh, a future of no juvenile uh, cancer. But don't don't sound like that. That's not interesting. That's not engaging. This is someone who. Just goes through and tweets random people, please help consider helping homeless cancer victim, and they say the exact same thing to everyone. Um, someone follows me on Twitter, you might follow YouTube Vanessa, and they'll tweet like, at Rory Jan Green, stop violating ethical codes, and then a link to his blog about ethics. And it's, that's very strange, and it doesn't sound. <laughs> it doesn't, has that happened to you? Do you know how I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> um, be a real, like, instead of like, you know, I might say, like, hey, Siobhan, you love cats, maybe you'll look at the latest post. There's got a really cute cat gift in it. Have a call to action. So what is the point of having this community? What is your goal? What can they do? You have to give them something to do. So for me, it's creating their own content. Um, Fundraiser Girl is largely crowdsourced now. I am predominantly not coming up with content anymore. I am just curating submissions. So my call to action is to submit people, for people to submit their own ideas. Um, maybe your call to action is to volunteer, to donate, to visit a website, but have something that people can do once you've got them engaged and you're having a conversation. Love on your community. Um, people have no obligation to be in your community. They can only even find a new community at any time. There are so many amazing things happening out there. You need to appreciate the people who are engaging with you online. Um, so this is someone tweeted me and he submitted something to my queue and he wanted to know how you know how long it would basically take to get up on these girl. I posted it right away, it was hilarious. Um, he also submitted it right. A lot of people submit really long when they're trying to submit hundred in a girl. So I thanked him for submitting it right. Um, it's not up there. I, I told him it was one of the funniest posts I've seen in a long time. Um, he says, I feel even more special now. And that's what it's about. Make your make your community feel special. Um, when Fundraiser Girl turned one, I looked at my most engaged people, and instead of saying, the site's having an anniversary, yay me, which so many charities do on their anniversary, like, SFU is 50, give me money, because I'm awesome, um, and no one cares, no one cares how old, you know, your charity is, no one cares how old your site is, um, what I tried to do is say, Fundraiser Girl exists, because of you, my community, and everyone who submitted like a couple, more than maybe ten posts got their own special, dedicated post that summarized their funniest submissions from the last year, and, and the community loved it. People um, felt very special. People felt very engaged. So, if you're a charity and you're celebrating your 75th anniversary, instead of not celebrating yourself and what you've accomplished, maybe celebrate some of your best donors and what they've accomplished with their donations. You can switch for that now. Thank you. Have goals. Um, you don't know where you want to go, you're not going to get there. And your goals can change and they can shift and they can evolve. Um, there was a time when my goal was to get more than five people a day visiting the site. Uh, and I've obviously gotten there and I have you know, new goals of where I want to get. Um, so I think it goes back to being measuring what you're doing and, and having metrics that you want to get yourself towards. Um, but you need to have an end place in sight, you need to have a purpose of what you're doing. There's a great book called Start With Why, and I really don't believe in doing things for the sake of doing them. Um, let's get on Pinterest, because all the like young people are on there. Set a boss to me once, you know, where to the why. Um, but he had no reason to be on there. Um, versus, you know, a lot of our volunteers are tweeting about their volunteer experience. Let's, you know, we're going to use Twitter to engage them and enrich their volunteer experience. That's a better goal than Twitter's a thing, right? Um, engage your community. I kind of just put this in here because I love that look like it. Um, so for me, <laughs> engaging my community is getting them to share their stories with me. The funniest submission that made me laugh the hardest was someone telling me um, about a direct mail campaign they ran. And when you, when you 
mail someone and ask them for money. You give them what's called a BRE, a business reply envelope, through which they can put their little check in and send it back to you. So there's someone in a lot of big charities whose job it is to open those letters. I, I had a job like that when I was starting my career. You know, code them in the system. Someone was saying they got a pack of hot sauce in a BRE. And I think that's so funny, opening an envelope and there's a pack of hot sauce in there. Like, why would someone send you hot sauce? And I, I emailed them back and said, like, you should have written them a thank you letter about the hot sauce. Like, I had tacos for lunch, and because of you, my tacos were spicy. And without your help, I would have had bland tacos. Um, I hope you will consider, you know, increasing your donation to a bottle of French Red Hot uh, next year. And so I asked the community, like, what is the strangest thing you have ever gotten in a BRE? And um, someone said, like, a, a bag, an empty bag of Doritos. <laughs> someone said they had a donor who would take the, like, tinfoil out of cigarette cartons and mail them in so the charity could put them on their ceiling so the government couldn't intercept mm. what was going on. <laughs> and they honestly thought they were helping. And they would go around and just hundreds, sometimes they'd come in the office on Monday and they'd be, like, a pile of cigarette Tin foils, you know, on the floor. Um, anyone else? Weird things people have mailed you at charities? Not a lot of direct mail people in here, I don't think. At least not people opening the letters. So let's try it. I'm engaging you all right now. Uh, who's, who's a fundraiser in the room? You can, I mean, you can participate if you're not a fundraiser, but um, what fundraisers want me to feel like this? Doctor Who looking at a computer, he's very excited about something. Segmenting the data right on the first try. Oh, yeah, awesome. Well, it makes you feel like this. This can be anyone who's worked in an office. My version of Razor's Edge that is so old that right now I'm a little bit of a virtual machine. I can't even the virtual machine because it's virtual. I, uh, so I work for the Faculty of Applied Science, and we have our own network. So we're not connected to the rest of the university. So I have to get to Blackboard, which is our razor's edge, like through this weird like portal thing that just shuts my computer down after about half an hour. And that's what makes me feel like that is like updating a donor's record and it doesn't save and then it's like Shh. Okay, I can't find a caption for this gift, but I love it. It is happy bouncing jello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fundraisers, what makes you so happy? That you feel like a, a little cube of happy bouncing jello. Anybody? Popsicles. Popsicles. Oh, yeah. We at BCIT we had a golf tournament and we had like a hundred freezies left over. <laughs> Jared is laughing because I have like four a day. And they made me so happy. And But I'd have to like not have the blue freezy if I had a donor meeting because I'd have the blue tongue that's very unprofessional. Yeah, she uh, had to check when I offered her a popsicle today. Yeah. You can't meet like Ryan Beatty with a blue tongue. You just don't. You just don't do that. And what happens when you engage your community is it becomes their community. Fundraiser Girl is not mine anymore. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to all of the people who have lived in this crazy world of fundraising and have the desire to share and connect with other people who do the same job. Um, I don't own it anymore. So you get buy-in. You get engagement. People take ownership of it, and it becomes a joy to be involved with because it is not effort, it is just coordination. Some of my favorite free stuff uh, that I recommend anyone with a limited or zero budget who wants to do digital engagement check out. Uh, Google Analytics um, is awesome. You can see, like, really creepy. There's someone on Twitter who has an anonymous Twitter profile. He goes by fundraising Yoda. And I maybe know exactly where he lives because I tweeted him once in the middle of the night and my people in the told me who was looking at it. So um, <laughs> that's really creepy. But like I can see like about twice a week, someone will, I have 169 pages of fundraiser girls. Someone is on 100, like 67, 68, 69. I can see, you know, how many pages, how many views per page, how many times people are on it on a given site where people are coming from, that's huge. Um, at Google Analytics is a great way to get to know your audience. I worked at a cancer charity and 
we started doing analytics and we realized the only people going to our website were staff. There were people from our building looking at it Monday to Friday from like 9 to 4. It was kind of embarrassing. Um, Twitter lists. I follow a lot of people on Twitter because I want to be engaging people in conversation. So I have a list of fundraiser girl submitters and posters so I can make sure I'm continuously having conversations with them. I have a list of favorite bloggers. It's completely free. I have a list of my personal friends, a lot of whom have unfollowed me because I post too much fundraising stuff. Um, Twitter advanced search is awesome. You can find, if you want, if you're, a, if you're an animal charity and you want to find people tweeting about cats and dogs in your immediate neighborhood or people looking to you know, acquire a cat or a dog in your immediate neighborhood, Twitter search can help you do that. Um, Hootsuite, obviously, uh, I am tweeting right now what I'm talking about because of Hootsuite. The future what? is now. Um, it's mind blowing. I couldn't live without scheduling tweets on Hootsuite. It is, and I, I just have the basic free, but it is my favorite. I'm so glad you're going there. I'll probably join you. And my Tumblr queue. So Tumblr can automatically tweet when a new thing is posted, and you can queue up uh, up to 360 posts. I think 300 posts. Um, tell it how often you want to post, what time of day. It's gorgeous. I absolutely love the Tumblr queue. Now I made some mistakes. I made some huge mistakes, um, which I'm going to tell you about. I don't have a Facebook share button on my fundraiser girl. That was a huge effing mistake. Um, I assumed that because I use Twitter and I don't really share this kind of stuff on Facebook that no one in my audience did, I also assumed that people knew how to copy and paste something from a browser into Facebook, which, like, that added step, like, people will just be like, screw this, it's not that funny, and just not share it. Um, and you can't measure it when it's happening that way. So, Rory, why don't you just get a Facebook share button, you might be asking. Well, I tried. But as a girl was having its busiest week ever, it had been featured on BuzzFeed and Jezebel, and I was getting like 15,000 hits a day. I was like, oh, this is the perfect time to add a Facebook share button. Um, everyone's going to be sharing it on Facebook. It's going to get even more popular. And I crashed the whole site. I ruined the coding. Thank God I backed it up. Um, so don't mess with things when you're at your busiest time. Like, mess with things on a, on a quiet Saturday morning, not on a Thursday afternoon. Um, and I never got that volume back. Like, people left, and it just went back to normal. And it never, like, I fixed it that day, and I never got them back. And it was really sad. Um, tagged posts to enable searches. So on Tumblr, you can say, like, this is a post about direct mail. This is a post about major giving. I, didn't, I don't do that when I post. It is just more work than I have the capacity to do. And you can't search Tumblr based on the title. And I had a lot of people saying, you know, I want to use Fundraiser Girl in a presentation. Do you have any stuff about direct mail? Do you have any stuff about storytelling? Do you have any stuff about Twitter? Uh, you know, and I kind of have to go through, you know, the 160 plus pages trying to find them stuff because you can't search by tag. Um, and I know I should start doing it. Honestly, if anyone wants to be a Fundraiser Girl intern, I will pay you in gifts, but it's just not happening. Um, some... Tumblr blogs do e-newsletters that send out every week or every month like their most, their funniest, most popular stuff. Um, I really should have at the beginning been collecting email addresses to do that. Um, I will probably start going forward, but I didn't, um, and that was a mistake. That's kind of all I had to say. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not the world's biggest expert on this. I'd love to answer questions if people have them. Um, there's a good chance someone's going to ask me a question, and I'm going to put it back to the audience to answer, but um, yeah, questions, dialogue, comments, concerns, curious. What's the next goal for your site? You said you, have, you talked about goals and uh, yeah. what would you like to see it going? Um, yeah, so I want to see it, uh, more submissions is a goal. I want to see, I'd like the, the posts themselves to have more likes and shares on Tumblr, but a lot of my audience doesn't have Tumblr accounts, so um, you know, six and one half dozen of another. Another goal is to have all of my posts tagged. Um, I want to break the 10K Twitter follower that's, that's there. Um, and I'd like to get to about 2,000, 2000 visitors a day. Because I think there's, there's audiences out there of groups of fundraisers I haven't reached yet um, by virtue of different time zones and different languages um, that, I'd like to, that I'd like to get to. Other questions? 
So for a while your Twitter handle was Fundraiser Girl, and now you use your name. Are you at all worried that like this person that bought was really nice and asked for a million dollars is actually really snarky and making funny pictures of me on the internet? Yeah. So I actually never had the Twitter handle Fundraiser Girl. It was always Roy Jan Green. Um, and I just say in my thing that I'm Fundraiser Girl by night. I, as a rule, try not to have anything derogatory about donors. A few might have slipped through. I don't know. Uh, they wouldn't. Have, they would have been posted by anonymous. I think you might have even tried to get a couple through on us. Oh. <laughs> nope. Um, yeah. Probably. So yeah. So what would happen if a donor ever looked me up on Twitter and saw that I'm doing this? That's uh, luckily for me. I work predominantly with a lot of people that don't even know what Twitter is. Uh, it's not been an issue yet. Um, and then a lot, you know, some young grads who have personalities and a sense of humor and get it. Um, my biggest worry is actually that my marketing department will see Fundraiser Girl because I am generally quite kind to donors and quite rough on my marketing department and on my finance department. Um, because brand standards and fiscal year ends are the bane of my existence. I hate them and I think they are detrimental to fundraising. Uh, I hate branding, I hate rebranding. Well, I don't hate branding, but I hate the idea that branding is use this font, make it this color, use the logo here. Um, for me, branding is the experience of calling, making a donation. What, are, what is the feeling? What is the content? Um, I've, had, I've had marketing departments tell me, like, no one can look at the camera. That's brand standard. And anyone who knows direct mail knows that, like, eyes are really powerful. And you need eyes looking at eyes. And I know when your marketing department says it's not brand standard, you want to like smack them. Um, I am worried about that. It hasn't happened yet, but it might. I might really alienate some of my marketing coworkers. But at the end of the day, um, I stand behind a lot of what I post. I believe in it. Um, or it comes from someone else. And I always be like, oh, this is made by anonymous. So it wasn't me. fundraising because, you know, the, the making people feel guilty. And I guess my philosophy of fundraising is asking someone to make a donation is an invitation to make the world a better place. And if you find the right person and you ask them for the right amount of money for the right project at the right time, you are never going to make them feel like they're a bad person for saying no. Make them feel guilty. It's going to be a joyful, wonderful experience. Philanthropy is a way for people to express their values, express their beliefs. But there's people out there that do it very differently. It makes you feel like a crummy person if you don't give. Um, I don't believe that that's helpful. I don't believe that that's good for our sector. Um, specifically to the student calling program, um, I'm personally of the belief what BCIT does is if you're, like you've graduated in the last three years, when they call you instead of asking for money, they let you know about the services and benefits you get as an alumni um, and, and do something for you before they ask you for money. So you're not getting a a fundraising call until after, theoretically, your student loans are paid off. I was getting calls from UBC the day I graduated. Um, I got a call recently, and they asked me for $20 a month, and I said, that's a bit more than I want to give. She said, okay, how about $360 a year? I said, I don't know like, how much math you're doing at UBC. That's the same amount of money. Um, and I really wanted to give. I wanted to help UBC. I love UBC. I love... You know, I had a great conversation with the, the caller who was a poli-sci student and I was poli-sci. I really liked her, but asking for that amount of money for my first donation really put me off. Um, I think you can do it well, and, and I mean, I always say, like, I'm so slick, when I ask you for money, you're, like, you're not even going to know, because you're going to be saying to me, like, Roy, how much money can I give you before, like, the time comes to ask? Um, and I think a good direct mail piece is like that. They've told you such a beautiful story and hooked you and You've gotten your checkbook out before the asks have even started. Um, but not everyone 
treats it like the art that it is and treats donors like their ATMs and just expects them to give and give and give. And that's where donors get sick, that's where donors get bored, that's where donors um, lapse, stop giving, um, and start viewing fundraising in a very different way. This is more of your fundraising side. Yeah. How do you balance between, because I've heard two things, I, I have to do a little bit of, well it's sponsorship, but it's really fundraising because we're poor. So how do you balance between, I've heard you can't, like you need to give a really short email because if it's long, they're not going to read it, but then I also hear that you have to tell them the story and you have to Right. Or else they're not going to look at it. So I'm really specifically with email, well, or just I guess mostly email and letters. You it? test it. Mostly like you, you do a short one, you do a long one. Yeah. See which raises more money. You tell a story, you don't tell a story. You see which raises more money. You also can keep the first ask really short and then expand the story after the first link um, to get into it because the people who are most likely to donate will respond quicker with less yeah. prompting and. As long as you have, um, I mean, I do advocacy emails, and I try and keep um, my email before the first act is 220 words or less. Um, and but I sometimes write like really long, you know, mm -hmm. short emails, and we'll get lots of people to take action. But I know it's kind of fundraising. And there's like a like a rule in fundraising that direct mail should be four pages, and um, because some people have tested it and found that in general four page letters do better. What those people don't realize is that that was based on testing a two-page letter, a three-page letter, a four-page letter, a five-page letter, and a four-page letter did best. If you can tell your story and you can raise money in two pages more than you can raise money in four, I take a two-page letter that raises more money over a four-page letter that raises less any day of the week. But you're not going to know that if you're not testing and you're not paying attention to what's working. And it is so much easier to stand in front of your boss or your board chair and say, this four-page letter outperformed the two-page letter so I don't care if you think it's too long, it's raising more money and that is what my job is to do. And you're basing your decisions on evidence as opposed to, I read this in a tweet, so therefore that's what we're doing. I know you said you don't use social media in your day job, but yeah. what do you see when for the role of social media in fundraising, be it major gifts, and giving, and all? There's a fundraiser, his name is Jeff Brooks, he's out of Seattle, and and another fundraiser called Tom Hearn, and they both talk a lot about surprising and delighting your donors. Whether you are doing it with a letter, whether you're doing it with a tweet, um, surprise them and delight them. So surprise them is tell them a story, tell them something new, share you know, the impact that their donation has had, um, tell a story in a new and unexpected way, and delight them. Make them feel like they are a good person for giving money to your cause. Um, I think a lot of us want to make the world a better place, and charities can help people feel like that is what they're doing with their lives. Um, I, when I was at the Cancer Society, this is one of my favorite stories, we had a donor who gave money and also occasionally would give his season tickets to the Canucks. And we gave them one day with family, uh, their son had cancer. And I, and I asked him to tell me a story about what the game, going to the game meant to them to, to tell back to the donor. Um, and, and I, one of the questions I asked him what was the best thing about being at the game. And the parent said this to me, it wasn't seeing Alex Burroughs score a goal, it wasn't they were from up north, it wasn't being in GM Place for the first time in our lives, it wasn't the popcorn, it wasn't the hot dogs, it was that for three hours we weren't thinking about Connor's cancer. That's a surprise, that's a, there's a twist to that. Um, so if you can do that one-on-one, -on -one, telling that story one-on-one, -on -one, surprising and delighting them, if you can do that with social media, that's the role I see playing, is making people understand the work that they are doing with their donations by telling beautiful stories and giving the credit to them. Other questions? All right. Sure. Oh, okay. Could you just walk us through how you set up the process that your community members are now doing the heavy lifting and you're doing more of the editing? Yeah, so um, I, I asked people to submit. I started by doing um, caption this GIF or what makes you feel like this and having people just share via Twitter um, what, what they thought and I would do that, I try and do like two or three times a week, ask people just on Twitter. Um, I would find people telling funny stories on Twitter and on Facebook and say, can I share this on Fundraiser Girl? And then as people got used to the idea of seeing their own stuff on Fundraiser Girl, I really pushed my submission forum 
So now I don't do caption this GIF for what makes you feel like this is often. I just say, you know, share your funny fundraising stories, share your oh my god moments, and the link to the submission form. Um, I always give the credit to the people that have submitted it. I try and make sure their Twitter handle gets in the tweet. Um, and I celebrate and, and thank people who submit. And, and my, my, the people who are most likely to submit to Hundreds of Girl are the people who've already submitted. So really stewarding and taking really good care of the people who've given me content and encouraging them to do it again. Um, I have maybe three people, Jessica, John, and uh, Alicia, who give me most of my submitted content. So I need to make sure that just like you would your major donors, that they're happy, they're engaged, they're thanked, and they want to keep doing it. I'm curious, um, you said you don't do this um, at work, but you spent a lot of time on the internet. Yes. So what does that actually mean, hours wise per day? <laughs> so a baby boomer asked me this question, and I think he was horrified. So I get up in the morning, and uh, my husband takes a 15-minute shower, and I scroll through Twitter. Um, I, uh, this takes about 30 minutes to blow dry in the morning, and I am also tweeting as I'm doing it. I'm, I'm one-handing, and, and I commute 45 minutes to and from work both ways. I am on Twitter on my phone while I'm commuting sitting on a bus. Um, I, I sit at my computer maybe half an hour, 45 minutes a day. Um, but my phone is always with me, so I'm, you know, 15 minute break at work, I'm scrolling through stuff. Um, I'm walking across campus, I'm one of those horrible people head down looking at my phone. So I'm not, like, missing out on sunsets and love and life and great wine, because I'm always on my computer. I, instead of driving a car to work and having, you know, 45 minutes of hating traffic, I'm spending 45 minutes engaging my community on my phone. I have Hootsuite on my phone, I can schedule content on my phone, I can follow people on my phone, I can do all of that. So I would say that like the, the spaces in my life of, of otherwise meaningless stuff are filled up with social media, but I think I have as much time to like carpe diem as the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. I'm sticking around, so if you have more yeah, questions, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you.